Hi everyone, and welcome to the Odinic School of Mysteries. I'm Bear, and I'm your host for this particular episode. Thank you so much for coming. So, mystery school philosophy is a bit tricky, right? There is a... Uh, everything you're given is multidimensional, meaning that it doesn't operate just in one plane. It's um, like, like, here's an example. All mystery school symbology will use the, um, we'll say the spear of Gungnir, for example, but this, this will, will apply to the all seeing eye to Jacob's ladder to you, you, you pick your pantheon, pick your religion, pick your mystery school, and it's going to apply to all of these. And um, the all mystery school philosophy is, uh, I'm sorry, all mystery school symbology, all mystery school symbology is three form in nature, which means that it represents three things at the same time. So if we're talking about the Spear of Gungnir, which is one of the primary and most important symbols in the Odinic mysteries, or in other words, in the mysteries of Odin, the Spear of Gungnir is one of the most important ones, most important symbols that we have. Now, the thing is, is that that represents three things at once. It represents a place in the physical body, which we'll get into in a minute. It represents mental phenomenon, a function of a mental uh, operation. And it also represents a spiritual principle. So I'm going to say that again. Every esoteric symbol in occultism and in mystery school philosophy and in esoterica there's three things at once. It represents a place in the physical human body, represents mental phenomena, and it represents a place of spiritual being. Okay. So, the, the thing to keep in mind is that you, you can't divorce these from one another. They all three exist at the same place in the same time. You are essentially a three dimensional Well, you are. I mean, it's to no one's surprise that you're a three-dimensional being. But people, what what happens though when you say that is people think to themselves, okay, well, we already know we're three dimensions. We're length with height. No. Though that is technically true, and you know, you know, you can't really argue with that. That's not what this is referring to when, when we say that you're a multidimensional being. It means that you exist in three places at the same time. You are physical, you're mental, and you're spiritual. Okay. There's a... So hold that and put that in your back pocket. And um, we're going to go into some stuff, and it is absolutely related to this. Um, it doesn't seem on the offset that it's related, but it's it's one and the same thing. There is a law. Um, it's also, it well, a better way of putting it, it, it's a key. And one of these days, we'll go into what a key is. But a law states that... Um, well, the actual wording of the law says, as above, so below. As within, so without. The people, um, we will find, you'll find this a lot on the internet, where people will, will hear that and they'll think, okay, the, clearly what he means, what this person means when they say, as above, so below, they mean bringing hell to earth. And though it might be that way in some very specific circles in esoterica in general and the mystery schools in general, as above, so below refers to the fractal nature of the universe. So what do I mean by the fractal nature of the universe? 
I mean that patterns repeat themselves. Patterns repeat themselves. So for instance, you could have an atom, and I've used this example before. You could have an atom, an atom has a nucleus, and it has these orbital bodies of protons and electrons that spin around it, that, that encircle the, the central en energy source. And then let's say you could jump up a little bit, and we're going to say that you have a cell. I know there's a few steps in between there, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll say the next step is a cell. A cell has also has a nucleus, and it also has these little orbital bodies or the organs that kind of surround it, that hold the DNA and that kind of stuff in it. And then you could do another jump forward. You could say a human body. A human body has a central power source, as a heart, and that heart generates an electromagnetic field, and then there's organs that surround the heart. You could jump up again. You could say that there's a planet. A planet has a, uh, at least what they call living planets, for, ex for example. It has a central power source and has various organs and layers and magnetic fields and that kind of stuff that surround it. You could jump even further and go to a solar system. A solar system has a central power source and planets or aka organs <laughs> That's that circle around it. Get up even further. You go to the galaxy. The galaxy has a central power source at the middle. They're thinking now it's two black holes, but I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they think. So it has a central power source. It has something that's in the middle that's giving it power. And then you have orbital bodies, which are the stars that surround it. And on and on and on it goes. Yet the if we follow this pattern out, I'm sure that we would find that the galaxies are like the stars, in which case they have a super galaxy <laughs> out there made up of, of the super galaxy is made up of galaxies. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case. That's just, if we follow the pattern, that's where I would expect that it would go. So, why is this important? It's important because if you understand that patterns repeat themselves, you can unlock many a mystery by understanding just this basic law. And the ancients understood this. There was an understanding all the way back into the times primordial that man was created in the image of the gods that man and the gods even were created in the image of the creator of all things, which the Hermeticists would also call the all. The all. It's the, what we might call the great mind for which all things exist within, as the Hermeticists would put it. So, with this in mind, with this, little nugget. Man was created in the image of the gods and there was this understanding uh, the, that man understood this at some level. And so if you want to discover the mysteries, you have to have a base point. You have to have some place that you, there has to be a place that you can see that all other things can be measured off of. Right? We have We have to do this no matter what, even if you're going to measure the length of your desk, you ha there has to be a place that you start where all things are measured against. And we do this in cities too. You know, you move to a new city, all things are measured against the location of your household or your friend's house. And so a matrix of, of streets and shopping malls and everything are all measured against the location of your house. Likewise, it was decided that the best and easiest place to measure all things off of was man himself. Man himself. So man, because we could look at man, and by man I mean mankind, the uh, humankind as a monolith, um, by 
looking at man, we can observe the the form and functions of the universe that are locked within him because it was understood that the patterns will bear out. Whether you're going smaller down into the cellular level and beyond, or if you're going to expand and go into the cosmic level and beyond. So man became known as the symbol of symbols. So all esoteric philosophy, all esoteric symbology is always, always based on a piece of the human body. Jacob's Ladder, for example, with the Masons and, and the Christians is the spinal column, for example. The Temple of Solomon for the Masons is the cranium, is the skull itself. The Spear of Gungnir, for example, is a picture of the neocortex and the um, pineal gland, the, which is the, the unifying principle, the unifying gland. And the spear shaft of, it actually represents two things at once. There's actually a, a plate at the bottom of the skull um, that is actually called, the, it's called the pyramid. And the, and then the, which comes to a point. And then there is a, um, a, uh, then the spinal column, it would be the spear, for example. So in that case, it actually represents two things at the two pieces of the body at the same time. So mankind is called the symbol of symbols. So when we want to figure out cosmology, when we want to figure out the deep hidden truths, what the esotericists do, what the mystery schools do, what my mystery school does, the mystery school that I came up in, what the mystery school, what my teacher taught me, is that you use the organs of the body as a a bit of a doorway to peek behind the curtain to discover some bigger and more ancient cosmic truth. So, in this, we're going to discover the. Um, the ascension of man as it is told in the story of the brain. And this is the story of the birth of the widow's son. So, the very first organ, the very first organ to be, that they tell us, was the neocortex. That was the very first organ that they tell us evolved in a form of a brain. We could have some debate, of course, on whether or not um, that is true or not. We could have a debate of creationism versus evolution at some point, which I think would be a really good topic. But... Um, I have to write it down, otherwise I will forget that I promised I would talk about it. <laughs> so, there we go. But we can't get into that today. So they say that the first organ to come out of the primordial chaos, so to speak, was is called the abdulla, or the lizard brain. And the lizard brain is responsible for things like it's the one that sits right at the base of the brainstem, right at the top of that spear shaft. It looks like a phallus, and um, it's gendered as masculine. And we'll get into what that means in a different podcast. And I have it written down. We'll probably get into it here in the next week or so. Anyway, it's gendered as male. And it looks like a penis for all intents and purposes. It looks like a phallus. And it, what it does is it's responsible for keeping the human body alive at all costs. It's where fight or flight comes from. It's where the need to feed comes from. It's where 
your sex drive comes from, all the operations of your anatomic system, the things that run automatically in your para, para um, it's called the, the para, um, para, uh, parasympathetic, I don't remember. Anyway, it's the, even like things like your lungs, for example, your lungs, your heart, your liver, your kidneys, the, the things that run on their own, that is what that part of the brain does. It keeps those running. Now, that was our very first brain. It doesn't have any emotion. It is just purely there to keep the body alive. The second body that was developed, that came out of the primordial chaos, is the midbrain. And the midbrain, just like human coitus, sits right on top of that phallic lower brain. And the midbrain is gendered as female. And that is the part of the brain that emotion comes out of. It's where we get the, the very first primitive versions of emotion. So, I think, you know, I said that we'd go into um, the law of gender at a different time, uh, but I think it would behoove us to go into it just, just enough to kind of give a brief explanation. Okay. Things that are masculine, things that are considered the sacred masculine in esoteric philosophy, are things that... So it represents two things at once. It represents energy pushed outward. So I want you to picture a battery, for example. The plus side of the battery, which is where the electricity leaves the battery and goes out into the circuit, that is gendered as male. That is a male principle. You have to think of it like in terms of sex. Like if you're going to have sex with your wife. The male side, the male portion of that, pushes energy out and into into the female, right the, through sperm and ejaculation. The if you look at the battery and you look at the negative, the 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 minus sign. I really don't like saying negative because it has the connotation of something bad, right? We say that's an, a negative. What he did is a negative action. It's that's not what I'm saying here. Um, and I think in the last few years, they've actually changed those terms from positive and negative to anode and cathode. Um, but everyone knows what positive and neg negative is, so I'm going to stick with that. But just bear in mind that negative in this instance doesn't mean evil or bad or something terrible. It just It's just the descriptor of the electrical current. And so the negative the negative portion of the battery is the portion of the battery that receives the electricity back into the battery itself. It's the, um, and that's what the feminine represents. It's energy brought into the woman brings energy into herself. So if we look in things like socially, for example, we could say that the sacred masculine, you know, men go to war, men go out into the field, men go hunting, the, the way men go to work. And I, I know that society has changed and all of that. But if we just talk about in generalities here and the way things were traditionally understood for thousands of years, this was the way that men were seen. And so that's the way that the symbols developed. And so if you're sensitive to this kind of thing, it is worthwhile to take a step back and just examine the, take your emotion out of it and just examine this critically. But the women, on the other hand, always received energy into themselves. So they were in charge of the household. So they, women were the ones who received guests. They're the ones who receive semen. They're the ones who receive the children into their arms. They're the ones who invite people in to eat. They're the ones, they're the, the warm, fuzzy, inviting principle of nature where men are the 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 ones that go out and um 
do the outward energy. So if we deal with the spear, for example, like the spear of Gungnir, and there's a reason why the spear is used because it, it's so potent. The, the, the point of the spear is masculine, but if you flip it upside down and you have that trough, like we look at, look at it like an equilateral triangle, that trough is the, um, that the feminine symbol. In, in traditional esoterica, we would call that the blade and the chalice. You know, because one is a cup and the other is a spear or, or a knife. Um, so, the, um, but on the other side, so, so on the other portion of that, the masculine also represents, in addition to what I just said, also represents, it represents kinds of knowledge that is only, um, that you could say is represented by something that you could quantify on a piece of paper, right? You could write it out. So we're talking like things like um, sacred masculine forms of knowledge would be like math, science, logic, linear time, uh, those sorts of things, right? Something that you could take about a piece of paper and you could do the math on a piece of paper, that is what a, the sacred masculine represents. The sacred feminine, on the other hand, represents things that are not quantifiable on a piece of paper. So we're talking like things like love, compassion, truth. Things like wisdom are considered masculine because they're, um, in general, they're quantifiable on a piece of paper. Something that is wise is quantifiable on a piece of paper. Something that is truth is not quantifiable on a piece of paper. It's too subjective. There's too much other stuff going on that makes it impossible to quantify. So therefore, it's a, a sacred feminine trait, which is why you always have wisdom gods and truth goddesses. If you really want to really dig deep into the myths and figure out what, the, what they're really trying to say, pay attention to the way different characters are gendered because it will go a long ways in explaining... The, the true mystery of what it is that the myth is really trying to tell you. Okay. Um, and things, you know, like, uh, like women also, the sacred feminine also represents things like, like um, infinity, it's things that aren't calculable, but are still all the same real. So, like I said, emotion is a feminine trait. The reason the Adam, the Abdullah, the lizard brain, is masculine is because it is purely, there is no emotion in it. It is purely an external lie. It deals with things that are external from the body itself. So it's like trying to keep you alive so you can go and fight the buffalo, for example. Um, it's energy pushed outward. Sacred feminine, the midbrain, <clears throat> is emotion. It's the, the, the primordial female that is sits on top of that phallic symbol, you know, in a sexual pose. And that is the, um, that's the, that's why it's gendered as female. So I hope you don't mind that we took that brief aside. We will of course go into it in much more detail at a different time. Anyway, so the way it works, is like this. Both sexes need to be present in order to create a child. And this applies to the left and right hemispheres of the neocortex, which we'll get into in a minute. And it applies to mental phenomenon in general. So not the physical gray matter, but, but the, the, the mind in general. In the mysteries, we accept the truth that the brain is not the seat of the mind. The mind is external from the body. And again, we could go into that some other time. So don't conflate the two things. The brain, the physical gray matter portion of the brain, is modeled after the mind, which is not a part of the body. It's external from 
the body. It's just an assumption. We think the mind is in the body, but it's not. Okay, it's just a gross assumption. Don't assume that. So, you have to have two parts of your, your mind, you have to have two genders in your mind at equal strengths in order to have good children. And we went over this a little bit briefly in my la in the last podcast with our conversation with Jason Wentworth of Rogue Elephant. Um, he's coming up with the um, I'm not sure when his first podcast will be coming out, but it'll be coming out here before too long. So you have to have two things at once. <clears throat> you have to have a mental. You have to have a masculine side. You have to have the feminine side. The feminine is the one who creates. It's the feminine side of the brain, of the mind. That um, I'm going to catch myself doing that. I need to be real careful not to do that because I don't want to confuse people. It's the, the feminine side of the mind that comes up with all the ideas because she is the creator. She's the one who gives birth. And this is a lot of the reason I don't want to get in the habit of ragging on Christians. But traditional Christianity, one of the reasons they, they really don't like the mystery schools very much and they hated the Gnostics so much is because the Gnostics, that what could arguably be one of the, the first incarnations of Christianity after Christ himself, believed in the power of the sacred feminine. In fact, in their myths, their creation myths, it is the feminine side who is directly responsible for all of creation. Not a masculine God, but a feminine God who is responsible for creation. And so, knowing this, the, it's the feminine side of the mind who creates. <clears throat> So, I used this example before. Let's say you wake up in the morning, your window is open, and you want to get a cup of coffee. Because you smell the fresh air, right? That fresh, crisp morning air blows in. It's winter time and it has that sweet, icy bite to it. And it fills your lungs with this cold briskness. You go, ah. And somewhere deep in the recesses of your mind, you hear a voice saying, you know what? A cup of coffee sounds amazing. And you decide right there and then you're going to make a cup of coffee. The feminine side of the mind will come up with all the, the things you can do with the cup of coffee, with all the emotional connection that you have with the cup of coffee. You could sit on the windowsill in the fresh air and read a book with the cup of coffee or listen to the news or look at Facebook or any of that stuff. That's the sacred feminine who's doing all of that. The sacred masculine is coming up with all of the numbers that to make that happen. It's the one who's figuring out how many scoops of coffee you need, the size of the cup you need to get, the temperature of the coffee that is required. It's the one who figures out where the coffee is located. It's the one that will, and it keeps the fem, feminine side in check. So the feminine side will be like, she loves it's all creation, but with no, no logic in it. So she'll be like, oh, we need to put avocados in our coffee. Or we need to put broccoli in our coffee. I'm being hyperbolic here, but essentially that's what I'm saying. Is that the, the sacred masculine will say, no, that tastes bad. And the sacred feminine will go, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. It'll, it'll taste bad. Maybe we shouldn't do that. So, uh, you know, I have... Um, we've all met people who are in love with cooking but are terrible cooks because they get caught up in the creation portion of it but don't have any knowledge. They don't have the sacred masculine in there to tell, you, tell them proportions, what will and will not taste good together, etc. 
right? So, you know, in order to be a good cook, you have to have both those principles together in order to make it happen. And so the two sides mate. The masculine and the feminine side, they mate. They have sex. And then they give birth to what is called the beloved son. You ask me, why is it, why is it a boy? Why is it a girl? And that's a really good question. We, we all notice that sun gods, for example, are always male. Why are sun gods always male? Why is Baldur male? Why is Jesus male? Why is Tammuz male? Why is Mithra male? Why are they always males? The act of giving birth is an energy pushed outward affair. Understand? Energy pushed outward is masculine. It's a masculine gender. So if you have the opportunity, go look at what a torus-shaped electromagnetic field looks like. It has a basically a magnet. It's, it's a magnet. You, you have a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other, and it makes a scene that kind of looks like a donut, where energy is pushed out, it gets caught in orbit, and is sucked back in at the bottom. If you, you look at that, you'll see the principle of what I'm saying. The masculine side is the, top, the, one on, the part on top that's pushing the internet out, the energy outward and the feminine side is the part that's that's catching it all back up and receiving it back into herself and then pushing it back out again and that is that giving birth is a masculine phenomenon it's a masculine trait so we're not really talking about when the myths are, are talking about this stuff, they're not really talking about girls and boys in the same way that in our modern parlance we talk about girls and boys. They're talking about actual science. And that's the way science was always used to be written. We have a tendency of believing that the ancients were stupid people because they believe in these fanciful myths and all of this stuff. Um, when we are these really advanced people who you know, have the scientific method and you know, advanced mathematics and all of this stuff, but we never stop to think for a minute, what if their language that is surrounded, that surrounds science, what if their language surrounding science is simply different and not stupid? You understand? And you, you got to... If you start understanding this, you'll go a long way into understanding um, the true brilliance of these ancient mystery school systems because they are well advanced in the knowledge of science. Um, you know, much more than what we what a modern our modern sensibilities would um, be pleased to give them. Anyway, so the, the thing that is born, we'll say like the cup of coffee, for example, is the sun. It's called the beloved sun. It's the son of God. It's the logos, what they would say in the Greek. Um, it's, the, it's creation itself. It's when those two principles come together and decide to make a cup of coffee it's that thing where after those two have consummated that relationship, out of that is born something in the physical reality. A mental phenomenon is called the plane of causes. And the physical plane is called the plane of effects. Okay. You can't change anything in the physical reality you can only change things in the mental space. You can, only, you can only change the parents. You can't change the child. <clears throat> I'm sure we'll get into that at some other point, too. Um, laws of causes and effects. So, here's the deal.
we so we come back to the brain for example you have the mother and the father and when the two mate they create a child and the child not only represents and has the qualities of both its parents but it is a vastly new being all unto itself. It is far and gone above the place where its parents had come from. And so, they give birth to the neocortex. The lower world is the, the when we talk sometimes about the land of hell and the underworld, um, there's many, many planes, many, <laughs> many aspects to that. But in this instance, when we talk about mental phenomenon and we talk about the brain, um, when we say the lower world, when we refer to the brain, we're referring to those primordial, that primordial brain, the animal brain. That exists in the lower world. It's the the lizard brain, the Abdullah, and its spouse and its wife, the midbrain. The two of those mate, then out of the primordial chaos comes the neocortex. And the neocortex, I know a lot of people will dispute this, and that's fine, I don't care. It has aspects of both its mother and its father in that. And the neocortex, that dome, is called the dome of the heavens. It's the land of the gods. It's the place where the gods dwell. And assuming both parts of your mind are equally balanced, the need for that lizard brain begins to die. It begins to atrophy. In a perfect world, that is what's supposed to happen. It's not supposed, it's supposed to give rulership from itself to his child, which is the neocortex. And so the executive functions then begin to be routed through the neocortex rather than through the lower brain. And this atrophy, the death of the father, which is the death of Osiris, gives, gives birth to Horus, Okay, gives birth to Horus, the sun god. Why is the neocortex called the sun? Another way of looking at this is because when you think, you can take pictures of this, there's thousands and thousands of them on the internet. When you think, your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. So to be an enlightened being in its most basic level, refers to a person who thinks because their brain lights up. And so the father dies, and from his phallus, Isis, the midbrain, extracts the seed that is Horus and gives birth to the sun. The neocortex. So, and then that um, that lower being dies and descends into the underworld, and that's why it is called the birth of the widow's son. That's why it's called the birth of the widow's son. That's because 
the pieces of the brain that were responsible for humankind at its earliest incarnations dies off so that its son may take over and rule. And we see this over and over and over and over again. We, we see in the Christian mythology where God the Father um, steps aside and gives rulership over to his son. In Egyptian mythology that we just covered, it's where Osiris dies and from his phallus Osiris is born. We see this in Norse mythology, which is the the um, the mystery school that I'm a part of. It's a Norse mystery school where Odin is is murdered and eaten by the wolf Fenrir, and that is how Odin, in our mystery school, you of course um, you can fight me on this if you want, but. Odin is eaten by Fenrir and then he finds himself in the underworld on the world tree. And that's where he hangs on the world tree um, to ascend again at some other point. But during that point, during that time, he descends to the underworld and his son, Balder, takes up his father's place in heaven. They switch places. Balder is released from the underworld and goes to the Asgard to rule, and his father is eaten by Fenrir, and he falls into the underworld, and he starts his cycle all over again. The ancients saw all things as cyclical. So, and we know we see this in our personal lives too. There's sometimes where we're very rational, we're very reasonable, and we're not controlled by our base natures. And there's sometimes where you get up and all you want to do is drink and have sex, and you you can't get yourself out of the underworld. Right? Things are cyclical, and it's a battle to keep yourself up in the heavens. Things that are things that go up must come down, as the saying says. And the, the symbolism gets super thick here, and I get it. And if you don't understand it on the, on the face of it, don't worry, you're not stupid. Because, frankly, it's complicated, right? It takes years of pondering this stuff to really begin to even start to wrap your mind around it. And you never really actually ever truly wrap your mind around it. Because it's, well, it's bigger than all of us. These... Stories are designed to make us think, and they're designed to um, teach us about the universe beyond just simple moral philosophy, if you understand what I mean. You know, the tendency is to think of, let's say, the story of Odin and his son Baldur as these really quaint you know, religions from a bygone era who are by and large superstitious and no one cares about them anyway. And we're the modern people and we have science and we don't need these myths anymore. But when you understand what the myth is actually doing, when you understand that there are certain truths that the ancients understood and that they they had actually explained to us in through the myths through the way that they understood science um we begin to understand that there's a lot more going on here than just a simple moral story and that's really important to understand the birth of the widow's son is um, probably one of the most important um, ideas that I have ever encountered, and they're the, one of the, it's one of the ones that will stick with you forever. Once you get it, you under, and you understand it, it's one of those things that you never really can ever really let go of. Um, so.
Thank you all for being here. My name is Bear, of course, and this is the Odinic School of Mysteries. I want to say a special thank you to Kelly Kraxberger. Or I'm sorry, um, Kraxberger is my name. <laughs> uh, a special thanks to Kelly Monahan for um, donating to the Patreon account. That really means a lot that you did that. Um, and uh, thanks to Inker for hosting us and being our first sponsor. If you want to email me or you have any questions, my email is in the description box below. And of course, um, you know where to find me if you ever need me. All right. Uh, stay safe out there and I love you all. Bye-bye.